We give you all the honor, the glory, and praise in Christ's name as we pray. Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening to all of you. Amen. Praise God for your presence. And now, of course, a special night. Our youth is going to present a special Christmas uh, presentation. Christmas cantata. Praise God for the efforts. Okay. Uh, no, don't forget it's coming Tuesday. It's going to be our music service. We uh, have moved our services just to be way to for uh, the family to celebrate the new year. So it's a Wednesday for the meeting again on Tuesday. Yeah, set the so Don't forget that, okay? So be sure uh, to be here Tuesday. And Tuesday, we're going to have also a uh, communion, a communion table. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, once, uh, once, twice a year, uh, communion with the Lord, okay? The Lord's table, Lord's cup. Okay, so please remind our members, okay? Uh, preachers, remind your members to this time and join us uh, this coming Tuesday as we uh, are kind of close the year, okay, you know, with uh, commemorating and remembering the, the, uh, the coming and the, uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very appropriate time for us to make up together. And uh, I actually haven't uh, uh, made a report yet about my trip to the Philippines that we just uh, spent some time sharing that with you. I didn't get a chance this morning. Okay, because of lack of time. But uh, I just would like to uh, express my appreciation for those of you who have been praying and praying for my trip to the Philippines and for those who also made some contributions in order for my trip to be possible. And uh, indeed, I was able to travel to different places. I did not only preach uh, to Ivy's congregations, I also uh, preached to other uh, pastors and preachers outside of IABC family. Uh, apparently, we are now getting uh, some uh, interest uh, to, uh, from other group uh, wanting to know the mission and vision of the International Biodance Church. I was able to meet the pastors uh, in Bulacan, and uh, after meeting some leaders there, they told me that uh, they would like to invite me over to speak in a conference next year. You know, 2015. Apparently, they have over 300 Baptist pastors in Bulacan alone. Can you imagine that? They asked them 300. Okay, where do you get those people? Of course, you know, I mean, uh, we throw a lot of Baptist pa pastors and churches in Bulacan. So just pray for that. And then for the Liera, of course, in uh, Baguio and also in Trinidad, uh, uh, another group also came to me and said, you know, Pastor, include us in your. I can next uh, next year, and uh, we can be able to gather about 50 or 60 pastors in Cordillera. Uh, Cordillera, I think, uh, I'm not even sure, you know, what what includes uh, uh, the part of Cordillera. I believe uh, Haunted Province, Trinidad, uh, Cagayan, and can we have, uh, you know, a Cordillera? Any, 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 anybody from Cordillera? I think it's the northern area, right? <laughs> yes, and uh, I was able to meet some pastors there, but uh, they have not met before, but uh, uh, they're just amazed with, uh, with, with, with what IBC is doing. And I also I went to Davao, I was able to uh, preach to a lot of our pastors in Davao, and in Davao I was able to, uh, to meet several people in Davao, that, uh, uh, people that they really, that really touched my heart. One, is uh, is a gentleman, further the preacher, I was a preacher, uh, back in the church in the uh, remote part of Davao, reaching the uh, tribal area. And uh, he actually was, he was in jail for over 20 years. The reason why he was in jail because he was among those who uh, were accused of killing Lilia Pino. If you remember, I forgot the name of the group that uh, the Marcos administration blamed for the murder of Kino. He was one of, one of those soldiers who were present in the tarmac when Kino was killed. And he said he uh, was in prison for 20 years, and uh, apparently about two or three years ago, uh, they were released. Okay, 
And so I asked him, point back, I said, you know, did you guys kill the Aquino? I said, no. We just got blamed. But praise God, he got saved. And he's now one of the pastors of, uh, of an IBC congregation in Mindanao. He is over 70 years old, you know, and uh, because of his incarceration, he, uh, his family dispersed. His what? wife left him. What? What? You know, he has not seen his children. And uh, in fact, he was, uh, he was even crying and was studying this to me and said, you know, I mean, my life uh, did not return to normal afterwards. Uh, that uh, accusation destroyed my family, destroyed me. But praise God, the Lord uh, took me uh, under his wings and saved me. And because of that, I surrendered my life to the ministry. Now he's passing the church. Amen. Praise God. We appreciate it. When I first met him uh, two, two years ago, uh, he lost his home. You know, it burned down. And so I was able to give him a little, a little cash to help him get stopped. So just pray. I forgot his name. I should I should be, I should remember his name. There's another uh, young man, about 37 years old, that also met me in the now. I think he's an old, old interest you. That's one of these young men is that uh, he fought with the MILF. Um, he was 16 years old until, until uh, uh, 24 years old. He showed me bullet uh, wounds, okay, you know, uh, where he got struck by government uh, military. And it's amazing that he did not die in spite of uh, a head and bullet wounds. But uh, you know, after that, so he served, uh, yeah, he fought for over, for over 10 years with the MILF. Uh, Praise God, he got saved. And uh, he's now pastor also in the Middle area. And when I was talking to him, he shared with me that, uh, that he has not, he had not seen his daughter for the last 10 years. Okay. And so uh, what I did, I, I, I I uh, got money in my pocket, gave me 5000 Go ahead and go home this week. After the ground price, I wanted to go home in two days and go to the Bunga and see your daughter. And uh, he did. He communicated uh, uh, with me two days ago and showed me a picture of his daughter. He said, Pastor, I pray, you know, thank you for giving me the money. I know it's my daughter. And uh, trying to spread it out that my family will come back together. Apparently, his wife also left him. So this part, right? His name was Baljik. Baljik. Kihana. Baljik Kihana. See here. Praise God for your junior members. Baljik Kihana. And uh, when he saw his daughter, his daughter got sick with typhoid fever. Right? I think you we sent some money to him. Yes. And uh, uh, you know he was he was uh, begging. Uh, some help from me when I was there, but I was able to money. So I said, when I come to the U.S., we'll try to uh, seek some help for you. Praise God. Our officials ask for the devil to send him money. So I, 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 I believe the daughter is fine now. Okay, recovered from my position. So please pray for that. And <clears throat> we still have a lot of pastors in the now, especially who are not uh, fortunate enough to have uh, enough resources in the ministry. Some of them are actually serving uh, in the remote area of the barriers and, and reaching to the tribal area okay, uh, in, 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 in the now. And their places actually uh, are places where you can find the NGAs, so you can find the uh, Muslim extra, uh, you know, extremes, okay, and uh, there's their uh, life. Is in fact, Bob Jay was telling me <clears throat> that uh, that he prays, he prays to God because because his uh, uh, old, uh, you know, uh, comrades with the Kenmaya that started to come to him. Because they know him. And he said, you know, he said it's close to be able to reach out to his old friends and uh, share with him the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's something I believe uh, we need to pray for uh, to uh, reach out to the Muslim community in Mindanao. And in other words, I want to thank Rose 
That was the time when, when Typhoon Ruby was supposed to devastate uh, uh, the Philippines. And uh, I shared it with our folks in Las Vegas. That, uh, that's one of my disappointments. I did not meet Ruby. <laughs> and it's so unfortunate that I was hoping, I was hoping I, I would experience uh, uh, going up the tree and trying to get away from the flood, and, and, but that did not occur. Okay. Uh, I think what happened is Ruby kind of inched uh, more to the north area, and so we only had a drizzle of, of, of rain during the night, you know. I mean, not, not even the rain. Just uh, rain. But uh, but praise God because you know I mean uh, praise God if that happens uh, because our conference, the conference with the pastors and preachers in in Negros, uh, was not canceled. I was still able to meet with uh, almost 50 pastors and preachers in Negros. Okay, uh, for the conference. So I I I, I probably. Uh, I was able to meet uh, about 600 pastors and pastors and church workers there. And uh, of course, the first I, I met with our Lubav brethren from Papanga, met with our uh, central Luzon area, and uh, we gathered almost 150 pastors and preachers in the conference of Luzon area. And the ministry of uh, Pastor Iscala. And so praise God for that. And I stayed in the Philippines for about a month, and then I came back on the 16th of December. And before I left, you know, Pastor Benny told me, you know, you got to come back here because we're going to have a big conference, Bible World Conference, on January 13 until 15. So, you know, I can come back. I can't afford it anymore. I spent too much money. Well, I need you here. I need you here. Both, both, uh, three of us brothers are going to be the main speakers, so you need to be here. And I can't afford it. But guess what happened? He bought me a round trip ticket. <laughs> so, I'm going back to the Philippines on January 8th. Okay? Uh, am I excited to go back to the Philippines? <coughs> well, you know, so so. Especially after the Air Asia disappearing. Yeah. Nobody can be excited to drop this down right there. Okay? So, uh, Air Asia, by the way, is also based in Malaysia. If you ever wonder why all people <coughs> in Malaysia are busy? Okay, the first one is, of course, uh, the one the one who disappeared, and the one who, uh, uh, who was hit, okay, in, 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 in Russia area, and then this one, okay, so it's spread, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll find a the plane. Okay, so I, I'm living in the A, uh, via Hawaii, United, United Airlines, uh, it's not Air Okay, it's not Air Asia. It's not uh, Malaysian Airlines. Okay, we're going to go to the Philippines very cheap. Long trip ticket. Malaysian Airlines. <laughs> or Air Asia. <laughs> well, you know what? You, you can take Asian Ashana. I took Ashana Airlines over to the Philippines last time. But the problem with Ashana Airlines, you spent 11 hours. In, in Korea. Okay, we're well, waiting for the next flight. So I stayed in Korea airport for 11 hours. Praise God, they, had a, they have a spa in the basement. So I spent my time in the spa, okay, with some, with some, with some guys there. Okay, so uh, I guess that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's okay, you know. So, so just remember that. You take a standard airline, it's, it's a good airline. Uh, at least you can go to the spa <laughs> and pay for yourself. There's my. Oh, it's not free. Okay, you have to pay. <laughs> you have to pay. I think I, I, I paid the less than fifty dollars just for that. Okay, at least it's a. It's a I, I stayed in the spa for about five hours. <laughs> what else? What else will I do? <laughs> you know, we go out to go, go to Korea and they don't speak English. And if you don't speak Korean, I end up getting lost. But, uh, <laughs> Alright, well that's the uh, uh, kind of uh, summary of my trip uh, to the Philippines. I'm looking forward again to go there. Uh, I'm sure I have some other speaking patients when they go to the Philippines. Uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I miss 
through the bridge in the lighthouse on Sunday because I didn't have any more time to preach. I preached at MPBC in the evening because I don't have any more uh, Sunday morning to preach there. So I know that when I go back there, I'll be booked on some Sunday. Okay? So praise God. Are you happy? Amen. 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 Don't forget, okay? I, this morning I cast uh, our thing. What is our thing for 2015? Preaching forward. Preaching forward in 2015. That's our theme. That means all our, uh, you know, besides everything, words that's uh, going to those things, that thing is going to go over. We love the Philippines. I, uh, somebody already contacted me from IUC Dubai Hill. Uh, Mr. Princess, our picture there, contacted me by Facebook, Mr. Pastor, I need the theme. And also from IBC Paris, Pastor, I need the theme. And so in the UK, Pastor, I need the theme. That's why I really had to, uh, really had to come up with a theme uh, within with, with, with the past few days. So praise God. So I'm impressed in my heart today, just got to see verse 13. Uh, the the rest of the picture is going. Please go on those things which are before us. Right? Okay. So Sam, please send us a sing of song. Uh, my son, uh, 
uh, one of our preachers here. He wants to serve the Lord. He is finishing his engineering degree, but his father got sick uh, two, uh, two years ago. And his father is now on, on dialysis, cannot work anymore. And because of that, you know, he cannot be able to finish his uh, engineering degree. He only has one semester left to finish. And it said, and uh, we need help. He only needs about 17,000 pesos to finish his engineering degree. You know how much 17,000 pesos is? Mm -hmm. Only 400 plus dollars. <laughs> so I, I'd like to encourage our college and career, and those of you who would like to help this young man finish his degree, <laughs> the 17,000 finish his degree. You know, I mean, uh, education in the Philippines is not much compared to education in the U.S. Now, four hundred dollars that's only is a that's only uh, uh, one one unit. That's textbook in the Philippines. One semester. Can I try to that? In the Philippines. Okay, and that's his last semester. So I I, I just want to uh, uh, share this with you. Maybe you can talk about this. However, you can be able to help this young man, okay, and uh, and maybe send that money when they go to the Philippines as that seven thousand, which is only four hundred plus dollars. If you're here tonight, okay, listening to this, uh, if you're able to give a check towards that, I believe you would appreciate it, okay. And then uh, when I when I spoke in uh, went back to Manila, there's another young lady, and this other is Sheila is actually our music director in Ayo City Bible. And he went, he went up to, uh, to Baguio uh, to finish his degree in music. Okay, and so he's now act, she's now actually serving in IBC in that, in IBC Baguio, helping, teaching violin, teaching piano, teaching voice. Because she is now in, his, in, in her last year of music education. And then she told me, the Pastor, is there a way for me to apply for a scholarship in Advocate Foundation? Because, again, I only have one semester left. I said, oh my goodness, I will say the story. Okay, how much? Pastor, any 70,000? <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe they talk. No, they did talk. If you burn the 70,000, you want to have this talk. She also needs 17,000 in order to finish her music degree in Baguio. Okay, so we have now two uh, college and career in the Philippines in need of uh, 17,000, both of them. Uh, close to You know, I mean, exactly how much is 17,000 in, in dollars? 18, 18, 18, 18. Come on, calculate that. How much is 17,000 in dollars? Uh, one dollar is 40. Four hundred twenty-five. Okay, four hundred twenty-five. That means, uh, uh, huh? Three five. Okay, three five. My goodness. Okay. All right, we can, we, can be, we can be able to help, you know, I mean, because in career, uh, anybody would like to uh, make a donation tonight, you know, just indicate in your check, you know, this goes to in Beatles when they go back to the Philippines, you know, let's make, uh, let's make uh, the future of this too. Uh, young people, be bright, okay? Anyway, they are serving the Lord, one is a preacher in Negros, and one is a music director in the North. So let's do this uh, uh, the two individuals, okay? I'll take that question. Amen. Good answer, everyone. Please stand as we draw off. The altar was restored.
ready to begin. This is my Bible. It is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It tells me who I am, where I can become, and where I am going. It renews my mind, changes my heart, and refreshes my soul. It is my daily bread. By faith, I will believe its promises, obey its commandments, and honor its principles in my life. With the Bible as my guide, I will walk by faith. Okay, um, at this time, we're going to have the youth choir come up for our cantata that we've been practicing. And I just pray that this one's a good one. You guys are
Jesus. As we remember back to that first Christmas, can you imagine being in the presence of the newborn King, Emmanuel, God with us? Let us worship him now, Christ the Lord.
Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. So let every tongue on earth be silent, let every voice in concert ring, evermore and evermore.
uh, I hope to uh, see him back and maybe lead our Bible college program here, amen, and being a doctor of theology. Is that possible? Okay. <laughs> okay. But I uh, really appreciate uh, his uh, commitment, his, his efforts, and uh, his desire to learn more, okay, about God, about the Word of God. So let's welcome tonight, Dr. John Paul. Amen. Nehemiah. 
and, and I, I told them my whole background of Nehemiah. They said, I haven't even read Nehemiah yet. I just researched on Google. And, uh, uh, you know, and, then, and then he said, that's how I know you know your Bible. And he said, so what can I preach on Nehemiah? I want to do it on teamwork. And I said, that's actually the perfect, uh, you know, a uh, perfect chapter or book to preach on teamwork because as they were rebuilding the wall. And then he was talking about how uh, he wishes his church had a training program and he wants to implement that. And then I showed him our website um, on the Ustream and he said, you know what, I'm going to watch all these Wednesday messages and how you guys critique. That's what he said. And then, and then um, because I told him that the, uh, the training here is, you know, not like other places. You would usually see um, people who graduate from Bible colleges come here and preach sometimes, and sometimes, you know, um, not not trying to sound prideful or you know um, uh, uh, criticize another you know, Bible college, but sometimes the preachers here, you know, we 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 have more experience in preaching than the ones that graduate Bible college because we uh, preach all the time here. So I just praise God for the opportunity of being here again. Um, I wouldn't be the person or the preacher I am today. I wouldn't be going to the school if it wasn't for this church. So thank you. Again. And let's all stand as we turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, many of you have probably memorized this. But this is going to be an expository message on Psalm 23. And when you're there, say a hearty amen. amen. Let's read all six verses all together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they conquer me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. <coughs> Our gracious and heavenly God, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this night that we come together, Lord, as your people, uh, to praise and give you the glory and to give you the glory of all of your Father, Lord. Preaching, Lord, is an act that only you can do through your servant, our heavenly Father, Lord. I'm just a mouthpiece, and may I preach nothing, Lord, but your word. <coughs> What the scripture says, Lord, and not my opinion. May I decrease, Lord, as you increase. I uplift the name of Christ, and I preach him, O Heavenly Father, Lord, and him through the Lord. If there's any here, Lord, that is not saved, O Heavenly Father, Lord, you have called, you call sinners to repentance, O Heavenly Father, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that if there's not anyone here that's not, if there's someone here that's not saved, that you may save them according to your will, according to your grace. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, in Psalm 23, as you study the Bible, one of the things that, um, that really affects me as I'm studying the Bible is I truly believe that this is the Word of God. One of the reasons why Christians don't really study the Bible is because deep in their hearts, sometimes Christians just think this is just another book. You know, it's just something that you bring up on Sundays. It's just, um, in your mind... You, you believe it's the Bible, you'll, you're a Christian, you'll say that it's the Bible, it's God's Word. But do you really believe in your heart that this is the Word of God? Because if you did, you'd have a passion in reading this and learning as much as you can about it. When you study the Bible, you're studying the mind of God as He has revealed in His Word. Even though God used men to write these books of the Bible, it is God who inspired their minds, their hands, and their hearts as they wrote this book. Charles Spurgeon once said, It is wonderful how God works by our hands, and yet His own hand does it all. In the Old Testament Hebrew, God is called by many names. When you study um, the original languages of the Bible, which I'm excited to take, it's actually funny because um, I'm going to uh, my school, it's an accredited liberal arts school, but also a Christian school. And um, I'm, my major is business, business and finance. And uh, as I was taking my classes with my counselor, um, he said, okay, um, what are the classes you want to take? And he gave me a list of classes that will go toward my major and that will go toward my electives. So um, I was taking, I, I'm taking New Testament, um, I'm taking um, 
business, a business class, microeconomics. I'm taking a, a theology class, just an introduction to a theology. And then I'm also, and then I was caught up between um, financial services management and the Book of Romans. And then my administrator was laughing. She was, she was just like, you know what? Why, why don't you just switch to um, a biblical studies major? That's what she said. Why don't you switch to a biblical studies major and not a business major? Because it seems like all the classes you want to take are Bible classes. And then I said, you know, I'm, I don't want to sound like I lack faith, but a biblical, with biblical studies, that won't pay the bills. <laughs> That's what I said. And I said, I'm going to take those once I get my business degree. That's what I said. Once, once I have my uh, regular degree, I'm going to take uh, go through seminary and uh, do all that. But as you study the Bible and you study the original language of the Bible, we know that most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And Hebrew um, and Greek in the New Testament they are more precise languages as you study them in the original um, language. You know, um, there are some people that argue that Christians, especially those who are very strong in the King James Version, they believe that we shouldn't go back to the original languages. And their argument is, is because if you go back to the original language, you're saying that the, uh, the English version is not sufficient. And that's, you know, that's what they claim, and I understand why they say that, but um, I, I argue from the point where, let's say, the King James Version Bible was translated into, let's say, Tagalog. If it's translated into Tagalog, uh, there's nothing wrong with going back to the original King James Version English because that's where it was translated from. You know, it's, uh, that's where it originally translated from. So when I read the Hebrew, the words that were translated by the original um, um, people from King James um, caused the translation for the um, King James Version. When you read Hebrew, it's very more precise. And in the Old Testament, as you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that God has many names. They don't call him God or Lord just like we do, you know. Many times as Christians today, we just say, thank God, thank the Lord, you know, praise God. And we just use God as a general kind of umbrella. And there's nothing wrong with that because he is God and he is Lord. But when you study the Bible in the original language, especially in the Hebrew, there were specific names the Israelites called him. Like El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai, Lord or Master. Jehovah Nisi, Lord my banner. Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sinkinu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Megadishkin, the Lord who sanctifies you. El Olam, the everlasting God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabiah, the Lord of hosts. And why am I mentioning the specific names of God that is used in the Hebrew? The reason why I'm mentioning this is it's a blessing to know these names. Because, because God reveals that he is truly the God of specific situations in our life. In times we experience trouble and discouragement, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. In times of need, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. In times of hurting, whether physical or emotional, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord will heal. God is very personal and very specific to what's going on in our life. When we need him to be our banner, he's Jehovah Nisi. When we need him to be our, um, to, uh, when we have needs, when we're lacking, or when we, we just um, are praying for a need to be met, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Because God is very specific to our situation and very personal to our lives. As we go to Psalms 23, you find that David says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The word Lord here, originally in Hebrew, is Adonai. In this psalm, David begins with the Lord. He says, the Lord, Adonai, my master, the one who I serve, the one who I give my life to. Because David had a high understanding of who God is. David did not have a low view of God. To David, God was more than just a 911 operator who you would just contact in times of emergency. 
to David, serving God was more than just an emotion because he understood who God is. To David, God is not some made-up deity fashioned in the minds of men. God was very real in David's life. And that is why David, in this psalm, calls God, Adonai Roy, the Lord my shepherd. David shows in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. By saying that phrase, David shows that he has a personal relation, relationship with God. He says, my shepherd, my personal shepherd. And he shows that he has his own relationship with God. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Is God real in your life? When you think of God, is there gratitude in your heart? When you think of God, is there passion to serve? Passion to read His Word? Passion to increase your relationship with Him? Or do you just feel nothing? David, in his personal relationship with God, understood who God is. David understood that he is not in charge of his own life, but that the Lord is his shepherd. As a Christian, you are not in charge of your own life as much as we like to think that we are. As much as we make decisions, as much as we, we make plans, we have dreams, we have goals that we want, as much as we have these things in our life, it is God who is our shepherd. And as Christians, it needs to resonate within our minds and within our hearts that Jesus Christ is our shepherd. Before he was crucified on the cross in John 10, in verse 11, Jesus Christ says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Lord my shepherd sacrificed his life so that I may have life, so that you may have life. In Psalm 23, as David continues this psalm, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And sometimes, uh, you know, with this, when it says I shall not want, we think of the word want as in I want this, I want that. Especially during Christmas time, you know, the kids. Mom, Dad, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And what the word want here in the original language is not I shall not want, I shall not want this, I shall not desire. It, it doesn't mean that. What the Bible means is I shall not lack. I shall not be in want. Because when the Lord is my shepherd, the shepherd takes care of his sheep. That's why I shall not laugh. With God as the shepherd of our own lives, he will take care of us. The reason why David can continue this verse and say, I shall not want, is because David had a very deep and personal understanding of the role and responsibility of a shepherd. Because David, before he was a king, was a shepherd. He was a shepherd boy who protected the sheep. He killed the lion, he killed the bear, he put his life on the line with the sheep. As I was studying this um, passage, I was reading, um, when you graduate from school, you, you do that final paper, you know, um, a thesis or a dissertation of, um, of a subject you pick. And I was reading seminary students who did their final dissertation on Psalm 23. And one of the ones, um, how this pastor, Omar Garcia, described it, uh, he described the role of a shepherd in a way that's very personal. He said, David acknowledged that the Lord was his shepherd. He had no other shepherd. He had no other master. His allegiance was to God alone. Shepherd is an intimate metaphor because a shepherd lives with his flock as God lives with us. He serves as protector, provider, and physician to his flock. The word want means to lack or suffer need. But only the Lord can satisfy the deepest needs in the lives of men. Only the Lord, the shepherd who is always alert to the needs of his flock, can correctly and adequately shepherd the lives of his own, so that we can claim, I shall not want. As I was reading this text, as I was thinking of it as a young man, as a Christian, as a preacher, we have to realize as Christians that we have no other shepherd. We have no other master. Christian, God is your protector. God is your provider. He is your physician. As the shepherd lives with his flock, God lives with us. He knows the very situations you're going through in life. He knows your emotional situation. He knows the relationships in your life. He knows your financial situation. Because God lives with us. 
And sometimes we worry about things that go on in life. What if this doesn't happen? What if this happens? What if my prayer request is never answered? What if, you know, so many of what ifs in our life. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ said, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking flock, can add one cubit to a stature? And why take ye flock for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. He said, consider the flowers, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? <coughs> For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. For Jesus Christ says in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The reason why David says, I shall not want or I shall not lack, is because the Lord is his shepherd. In verse 2, David continues and says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Sometimes in our own lives, we like to go our own way. We like to take our own directions, make our own decisions. One of the things that I am thankful for is that God doesn't always allow us to go through with the decisions we make. You know, have you ever wanted something so bad and God said no, and then, and then afterwards you're so thankful that God didn't allow it to happen because it would have been like a train wreck? You know, there was one time, I wasn't going to mention this, but there was this girl that I really liked. Not saying, but she was really pretty. That's the reason why I liked her. You know, she was really pretty. And she had a nice voice, but the eyes, the eyes just got me. That's, that's what happened. And, and then I rationalized in my mind that I said, you know what? I could get her saved. Um, you know, um, you know, she could come to church and then... And then, and then, you know, I just rationalized how I was going to plan on getting this girl, getting her saved, and have her all of a sudden just become faithful to the Lord. And, you know, for some people it happens. But I rationalized in my mind, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. And then I realized afterwards, I am so glad that this, this did not happen because it would have been a train wreck. It would have brought me down spiritually. Amen. <laughs> we have a testifier over here. <laughs> Sometimes we like to go our own way. We like to make our own decisions. And after God says no, you realize that if he allowed it, it would have been a train wreck. But I praise God that because even in bad decisions, he is our shepherd. He is the one who protects us even from ourselves. Even from ourselves. In verse 3, he says, He, meaning the Lord our shepherd, restores my soul. It is God, my shepherd, who restores my soul. Not only does the Lord bring us back when we like to wander, but he also renews us and restores us when we need it. Because the fact is, as much as we have our big Bibles, as much as we dress nice for church, as much as we pretend that life is good with God, we as Christians grow weary. Pastors grow weary. Mothers grow weary. Fathers grow weary. There are times in our walk with God that we grow weary. We experience discouragement. We experience loneliness. We experience fear. We experience heartbreak. We experience tears. We feel burned out in the ministry. Many of us lose passion to serve the Lord. Growing up in church my whole life, I've learned that it's easy for Christians to hide what they're going through. It's easy to hide sadness under a smile. It's easy to pretend that everything is okay when in your heart you're questioning what God is doing in your life. 
It's easy to serve in the ministry even when your heart is not in it. But although we experience those things, it is amazing. God still remains our shepherd and restores our soul. Amen. Out of all the tragedies and heartbreaks we experience in life, God was always there. And the reason we can sit here tonight and praise Him is because God, the Lord, my shepherd, restores my soul. Sometimes we get so caught up serving the Lord that we forget about our relationship with the Lord. We become too busy with ministry and goals and programs that God becomes second and service becomes first. But never let us forget that God is the reason why we serve. The reason why we have this church building program is so that God gets the glory. When people get saved, God gets the glory. That's why David continues in the verse and says, He leads us on paths of righteousness. He leads us on the path of righteousness. For not ourselves, for not our families, for not other people, but for His name's sake. For His name's sake. Sometimes in our walk with God, we don't realize that we become self-centered. That our walk with God becomes about us. Sometimes we, 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 for, we don't realize that. You know, I wonder where the Lord is going to lead me. I wonder how God is going to bless me. I hope God answers my prayer request. Not realizing that we become self-centered. We don't realize that everything the Lord brings us through is to ultimately give Him the glory. Nothing happens in a Christian's life by accident. You know, sometimes we like to think that God is responsible for only the good things. But there are also things in our life that we don't want to experience that God allows us to go through. And the reason for that is because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. If we didn't go through heartbreaks and tragedies in our life, then, why would, then when would we need God? Why would we need God? But the reason why He lets us hit rock bottom is so the only place we can look is up. As David transitions to verse 4, there's a shift in his tone. Because in verses 1 through 3, he's saying that you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Because it is the Lord who leads him. It is the Lord who guides him. It is the Lord who restores him. It is the Lord who directs his path. In verses 1 through 3, David meditates on who God is and what God has done in his life. And I believe as I was reading this, this is one of those moments that David was having where all of us can relate because there are moments in all of our lives where we just contemplate on life. You know, sometimes it's laying in bed. You're just laying in bed, contemplating on life. Sometimes it's sitting in the car. Sometimes it's when we're sitting at the kitchen table. Sometimes it's at work, where you're just thinking about life and everything you go through and everything you want to happen and everything you hope will happen. And you know, just one of those moments, quiet moments that we have in life where we're thinking about life. In verses 1 through 3, David meditates on what God has done in his life. <coughs> Have you ever had a moment when you remember the things in the past that the Lord has brought you through? You think of hardships, and you think about how the Lord brought you through that. Emotional circumstances, physical circumstances, financial circumstances, relational circumstances. Many of us can testify that the Lord has brought us through so much. And as David transitions to verse 4, he no longer is talking about God. The Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. He's no longer using that tone. But he's no longer talking about God. But as he contemplates on his life, he begins talking to God. Because as you read verse 4, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He starts talking to God. You are with me. After remembering all the things that God brought him through, David says, I will not fear the valley because, God, you are with me. As Christians, we are taught, like Pastor Ernest said, not to dwell on the past. And there are things in the past that we shouldn't dwell on because some people get so caught up in the past that they don't move forward. But if we are to dwell on something in the past, 
It should be on how the Lord has been so good to us. How the Lord has brought us through so much and we can still be standing, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. As you examine your life, you will notice God's fingerprints ever so clear. I have seen how God's hand has guided me in my own life. Before I joined the Air Force, I prayed for it for a year. And then God gave the confirmation, I joined the next day. Because when, when um, I say I'm going to do something, I'm one of those people that's going to do it. I said I'm going to join the Air Force, I prayed about it, I joined the Air Force. When I said I'm going to go to uh, Bible college, I, I went to Bible college. And it's funny, because I was originally going to go to, um, it was either Golden State or West Coast Baptist, one of those schools. And I, I talked to um, uh, Philip Goldschild, one of my uh, friends from my old a different church youth group, but we used to be in the same fellowship. And um, he, he was telling me about Golden State. Yeah, man, you can go to, you can go to Golden State. Um, ask them about, you know, that. And then, and then I talked to Dave Velasco, and he was telling me, why don't you go to West Coast Baptist? You know, I go here. Um, and then I'll call the admissions, the um, admissions for you. And this is the guy's name. I forgot his name. And just, just talk to this guy. I told him that you're going to call. And then I remember sitting in my room with my phone in my hand. All right, I'm choosing what school I want to go to. Like David set everything up for West Coast, for West Coast. So, so then, so then I was, I was ready to call, but I was like, no, I'm not gonna call. The next day, I was ready to call. I said, no, I don't call. And then, and then I was wondering, like, why don't, why don't I just call? And then, and I was, and then I went on Google and I searched um, Christian schools that accept the GI Bill. And then, and then, um, and then. The, one of the first ones I saw was um, Biola University, Azusa Pacific, and then, and then I saw Master's College. And then, and then I, I read all the doctrinal statements of each one from Golden State to West Coast to Azusa to Biola to, um, to Master's College. And, and the Master's College was the only accredited <coughs> school that stands strong on the doctrines of grace, sovereign grace. And then, and then I said, this is a school for me. <laughs> and then I talked to uh, their military counselor. And then he said, he said, I'm serving in the Air Force Reserve right now. And I'm going to be your um, admission counselor. And I said, I'm serving in the Air Force Reserve right now. I'm going to be the person you counsel. That's what I said. <laughs> and, then, and then my admissions counselor for regular classes uh, was like, hey, JP, um, my name is uh, Theo. And then I, I was joking with them. I, I just wanted to see how Christian they are. So I said, I said, is Theo short for uh, theology? And then, and then he started, he started laughing. And then he said, before we start, let's pray. And then we prayed. And then he, he wasn't giving me a pitch to come to the school. He said, if this is God's will, this is God's will. And I prayed about it for another three months. And then God led me there. And in our own lives, I was thinking, God didn't lead me to go to West Coast. He led me to go to Masters. And that's the reason why I joined the Air Force, is for God to send me to Masters. And it's so clear now, because I would never be able to afford Masters without my GI Bill. In our own lives, within your own personal situation, remember that nothing in life happens by chance. Nothing in this life happens by accident. The Lord is my shepherd, and I do not fear because he is with me. And he is with you. He is your protector with his rod and his staff. In verse 5, David says, Even in the presence of enemies, God's presence is the only one that makes a difference. David personally experienced God's anointing as the next king of Israel. Remember the story of how David? David was the youngest in his family. And then um, Samuel came up. And uh, all the sons passed by, sons of Jesse. He said, none of these are the ones. And then when he saw David, a ruddy boy, he anointed him as the next king of Israel. So David personally experienced an anointing. He was going to be the next king of Israel. But as Christians, we are also anointed. Because we are God's sheep. We are his people. And God blesses his people in special ways. The special blessings that God has for you is not for everybody else. It's for you. The special blessings that God has for IBBC, for its ministries, is not for other churches, but for IBBC. David recognizes that life is a journey and the end goal is to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Because in verse 6, 
he recognizes that it is the Lord who guides him, and it is the Lord who protects him, it is the Lord who leads him. And he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because David recognizes that life is a journey, and the end goal is to go out in the presence of the Lord. I, I've read um, um, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and I believe that every Christian should read that book. Amen. Because that book is... Um, Charles Spurgeon read that book 100 times. George Whitfield's read that book hundreds of times. Jonathan Edwards has read that book hundreds of times. And, and as, as, as you read that book, it's a story of how a Christian gets saved and he's on his way to heaven. But it talks about all the struggles that he goes through. And his name is Faithful. And then um, there's a whole bunch of people that come along that he meets that distracts him. And um, he falls asleep going up a hill. And there's just a whole bunch of things in that book. And, and that book, once you read that, it, it just amazes you how God, this was written in the 1500s. And it's crazy how even then we can relate to the struggles of the Christian life even now. After I read that book, I read the book of Fox, uh, Books of Martyrs. Uh, how, uh, how there was Christian martyrs from the first century all the way past. And, and then I started reading the biography of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and Pastor Hernandez was talking about street preaching. He, he said, who here wants to street preach? And all the preachers were kind of quiet. You know, I raised my hand because I know he's in the Santa Clarita. <laughs> but as I, I was reading George Whitfield's life, George Whitfield, uh, he was a contemporary of the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley. They started the Methodist Church, and they joined the Holy Club. And in the Holy Club, they would pray, but none of them were converted. None of them were saved. And then there came a point where um, the Wesley brothers were straight Arminians, and, and uh, um, George Whitfield was straight sovereign grace. So they were friends, but they clashed on doctrine. And, and there came a point where George Whitfield would preach and preach and preach about uh, the souls of men. He took, he took the doctrines of grace and he took evangelism and married them together and created an explosion and was preaching that he was not allowed to preach at a pulpit in England. In the Anglican churches, um, they did not allow him to preach. So, because he wasn't allowed to preach in the, um, in the pulpit, he would go to the fields. He would his makeshift pulpit and he would preach. He would ride on a horse from town to town to town in, 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 the, in the town center. And then he would, he would ride on a horse and preach from the King James Bible with a Matthew Henry commentary. And once he was kicked out of um, the pulpits, he would go to the fields. And the first people he preached to in Bristol were coal miners. And what he would do is that the coal miners were known as people worse than sailors. They, 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 there was even stories of them who defiled bodies of corpses, you know, dead corpses. They would defile those, you know, do things with those. And, and because he was not allowed to preach in the pulpit, he would bring uh, a wooden um, little pulpit, and then he would go to the fields and start preaching, and then the coal miners would just make fun of him. They would just, you know, laugh at him. And then he would preach, and the original 200 people he preached to coal miners, they were, they were people who worked down deep in the earth, with black faces because of all the soot and the, um, and the cold. And then as he was preaching to them, repentance, Jesus loves you, God is there, he calls you to turn from your sin. He, he said, all of a sudden, there were white stripes down their face. And then I was like, I was reading this, I was like, white stripes, white stripes. And it's because their faces were so black from working down in the earth that there was tears coming down their eyes. The next time he preached to them, there were 2,000 people that listened to him. The next time he preached uh, after that, there was 5,000 people. The next time after that, 20,000 people. The next time after that, 30,000 people. He would travel to America and preach in the colonies. He was friends with Benjamin Franklin. The people who sat under his preaching were people like, um, uh, I forgot his name, but the person who wrote Amazing Grace. He would listen to him. And sometimes people like to criticize the Bible. There's no way that Jesus Christ could preach to 5,000 people and they were able, and he didn't have a microphone. And yet George Whitfield preached to 20,000 people. Everybody signed, were able to hear him for miles. 
he preached at Jonathan Edwards Church because they were friends. And because of his preaching, Jonathan Edwards, the next uh, time he preached, preached his famous sermon on sinners in the hands of an angry God. And then as George Lithgow preached, um, people were getting saved, and he was doing that through open um, field preaching. And there were times where people were throwing dead animal parts at him. There were times where people were climbing up on trees and urinating on him. There were times where people who were in the marketplace were getting mad because he was drawing in all the crowds and they weren't getting any business, so they would do whatever to him. And he would preach five times a day. Five times a day, every day. He spent two, if you counted all the time he spent on a ship just to travel to the um, United States and back to England, he spent his life two years just traveling on a ship. And then I read about him, I read about Jonathan Edwards, about Charles Spurgeon, about William Carey, and I read about these people, and I think, what have I done? And then as I was reading, you know, as I studied the Word, as I studied David's life and how God is our shepherd, one of the things that I realized is that Apostle Paul only is somebody because God made him somebody. Charles Spurgeon is only so um, significant in the ministry and in the Christian world is because, is because God made him somebody. God doesn't have the same um, calling for everybody. He doesn't call everyone to become a big-time pastor. He doesn't call every church to be a big-time church. But he calls everyone here to serve him in their own special way. You know, going to my Bible school and my uh, taking business and, and Bible classes, you know, I'm going to be a small fish in a, in a large ocean. I guess you can say that phrase. But yet... It is God who made the sea. And what God has placed for me is different from what God has placed for you. If God has called you to serve the youth, then that's the, God, that's the calling God is going to hold you accountable to one day. If God has called you to lead a ministry, you're going to be held responsible for what you do in that ministry one day. Sometimes we get so focused on ourselves, what we want in life, how come things aren't going my way. Uh, you know, we play the pity game. But if we just serve God and recognize that He's our shepherd, He's the one who guides me. He's the one who protects me. He's the one that's going to cause everything in my life to go the way it is. Sometimes we get disappointment. Sometimes we go through discouragement. And that's just being human. But with God as our shepherd, He recognizes when His sheep need help. Don't get so caught up with things not going your way. I wish things were different. I wish my life was like this. Just remember that. God is my shepherd. God is the one who leads me. I place my faith in Him. I place my trust in Him. His timing is not my timing. According to my schedule, God may be late, but according to His schedule, He's right on time. Amen. David recognized that even if things in my life aren't going well, God is my shepherd. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's all stand as we pray. Father, Lord, God, I thank you for this evening, Lord, that I was able to preach your people a simple truth, Lord, in Psalms 23. I just pray, Lord, if there are any hearts here that will touch, that they may come forward, oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, to you in their hearts, and that they may, oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, repent of their sins, and that they serve you, Lord, with a new fire, with a new passion, Lord, as, as a Christian should, oh, Heavenly Father, Lord. This life is short, and we get so caught up with things that are outside of what we should be doing, Lord. But help to shift our focus back on you. Help us to calibrate to the right place where we need to be. And I pray all these things as I call them Pastor Ernest to leave the invitation.
experience Christ, not until you experience Him as a good shepherd. You know, too often we take control of our lives. We say we are Christians, we say we're children of God, but we don't really take Christ as our shepherd. So often we set him aside, we push him out, we take control. Because if we consider Christ or Jesus as our shepherd, then that means he's everything. That means Jesus is our perfect relationship. He's our father, he's our mother, he's our sibling, he's our friend, he's everything. That means he's our provider. And because he's our, our provider, then we will not seek from any other. He's our comfort. He's our restorer. He's my leader. He's my guide. He's our protector, our power, and strength. He's our daily companion. He's our planner, the one who prepares the path for us. He's my blessings. That's what God is. That's what He becomes when you consider Christ as your shepherd. Praise God for that message, for example. Out of your heart, maybe you've been a believer, a Christian for many, many years. So the question I have for you is this have you, or do you really? Are you experiencing Christ as your shepherd tonight? Are you truly finding him as your only comfort? Or as your only companion? Or do you still seek somebody else to be your companion, your comfort? You better touch your hearts tonight. I welcome you. I ask you to be where you are, come to the altar. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for reminding me that you are my shepherd. And forgive me to walk tonight. I don't want to consider you as my shepherd. I want to take control. So often I feel that I can get help from others. That my friends are enough. My work is good enough for me. My ambition is good enough for me. My family. The Lord is my shepherd. He is a great shepherd. Once we realize that, and that means you really experience God. You really experience Christ. Our Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this message that reminds us again, oh God, of who you are to us. And why should it be for us? How many times, oh God, we we try to seek comfort from others. We try to seek strength from others. From people we know. From 
the means of life, O Lord. <coughs> we seek others but you. But thank you for making us realize again tonight that you're the only one to need. That you are everything for us. That you are our only helper, our only pride, <coughs> our only power, our only strength. You are the best gift. You are the blessings. I pray, O oh God, for great John Paul of Lord as he found you within his life. Here tonight, our pastors, our leaders, O oh Lord. And all of us, O oh God, will fully realize and claim you, O oh God, as our shepherd. Even as we are ushered, O oh God, in the new year of 2015, the more we need your guidance, the more we need your grace, the more we need your power. The more we need you as our provider, as our leader, as our guide. Help us, O oh God, depend on you alone. Thank you, O oh God, for the music that we heard tonight from our youth group. Thank you for the efforts of God, for the time that they gave, O oh Lord, to practice the songs. Thank you for my wife, Angie, for leading them. You and the rest of the leaders, oh God, for bringing them together. They let them together as one. Thank you for the people who, people you brought tonight to listen to this beautiful music, oh God. And oh God, you brought us together here for a reason. We're blessed by you, we're touched by you. We're encouraged by you, oh God, to the message in songs and also in the preaching of your word. That nobody will leave this place, oh God, from being touched by you. Again, oh Lord, I commit everything to your hands, oh God. For our visitors tonight, for our young people, oh God, our parents, our preachers, sir, everybody, oh God. In the religious place, O Lord, you always remember the message that we heard. So we give you all the praises and all the glory. In Christ's name, against all these things. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, once again, I'd like to uh, ask our house of uh, uh, media, right? We're going to have a uh, 
for the Indian this coming Tuesday. My fair leaders, don't forget the fair, the road stable Tuesday. We're going to have the Indian road supper. I'd like to invite all the members by BC to sell and have our road supper. This will be our opportunity to come together as a church family. And that's just a uh, new regard to this last day of 2014. It will begin from the 7 o'clock this coming Tuesday. All right? Okay, so uh, be sure to be here and remind the rest to come. Okay, and uh, uh, keep playing 15. What I'm going to do is go to the schedule of the Lord's Supper and the quarter day. Uh, I don't want to make it uh, a regular thing so that we don't any more treat it uh, special. Okay, but uh, you know, but, but I would like to have this quarterly quarterly Lord Supper. Okay, but you know, so please join us coming Tuesday. Okay, all this week we we are moving our video service on Wednesday to Tuesday to allow our family to stay together during the uh, uh, you know the new year. All right, okay, all right, all right. Okay. and uh, so please pray for Christian John Bowman and you. Tuesday, go to go to the space. Okay, see you in Vegas. Yeah, he's going to he's going to fundraise Vegas. Okay. Now, uh, just like what I said, uh, every last Sunday of the month, I'm going to have. Uh, our students are going to have the youth to be in charge of the service. Okay, so at least they're part, uh, part of your involvement, participation in the program. You know, uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that because I want you to really experience uh, the worship of God. Of course, you know, be sure uh, give us a program and be sure to report to us your program so we can be able to uh, make some changes if you want to, make decisions. Okay. You can give us the schedule and all the prosecutors, all right? Okay? Any 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 announcement? Any more announcement? And we have our late days before before 2014. It's uh it's old. Three more days. Monday, November 9th, 30 and 31. Three more days. And after three days, 2014 is old. Okay, we're not going to the new year. Are you excited? Huh? 2015? Amen? Okay. All right. And more announcements. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Okay. Let's all stand up, please. Let's take our last song.
who's that right? Uh, Dismiss us the Lord in prayer. A future preacher here. Here tonight, O oh Lord, be a blood in our lives forever. Amen.